So as summer approaches, and now it's here, we are not slowing down. We continue to be called in creative ways to do something new or to renew. As Christians, we renew our minds with the sacred scriptures that have guided us to this point. And so each week, I've asked you to bring your Bibles or to use the ones in the pews in front of you and highlight the scriptures that we are using them. So today, we are opening them up to 2 Kings. Now I'm going to give you a hint that comes after 1 Kings. Just here to help for those who may not have had to memorize the song 8 million times like I have. And so if you go into 2 Kings, you can find the um, verses that are listed as well. And then you also will have Acts that is marked from today with um, the story of the Ascension. So you have several things that are here for you to take time to highlight. And as you go into your Bibles and highlight them and use them, I want you to remember this quote by Teresa Cho. How would worship be different? <laughs> if I approach worship like when we're together, we will learn, experience, and practice our faith. What if worship were a Bible study, a mission field, a fellowship, and a worship service all in one? You see, when we started with Paul a few weeks ago, I presented actually quite a few difficult questions dealing with how we use, understand, and apply the Bible and the scriptures in our lives. And I did note at that time that how we use the Bible text is not a simple text. It is messy business. It is highlighter and research business. And what I have come to find that we all do when using the biblical text, text is we are not always consistent in how we understand and respond to this book and our faith, and thus it sometimes makes the ingredients for our faith produce something more that looks like a creation from the show Nailed It, other than a creation from Zumbo's Desserts. While many of us have access to the biblical text that is in our pews or in our homes, many of us really do not always know how to use Maybe today, I wonder if we treat it a little bit like a cookbook. Our faith can be multi-layered, or it can be a mess. It can take skill and practice. It takes knowing some of the basics so that we can see how God wants to create a quality masterpiece for all of life in different ways that overcomes the hurt of the world in many times and in many places. So today's scripture is the story of Elijah being taken away in a chariot. But the ingredients for today's sermon started for me as I was researching this to become very overwhelming. And so I must be honest, as we go through this recipe today together, it may end up to look more like the nailed it cake than the other cake done by the professionals. Because here is a list of the ingredients. One cup of Elijah, one cup of Elisha. Automatically confusing, right? And then half a cup of several parting waters, one teaspoon of the Ascension story, seasonings of different prophets and peoples who are observing. So it's a prophet mix. Half a torn mantle, like this. And then if we want to become more advanced in what we're creating, let's say we know how to make this, but we want to add some new style to it, we have a cup of a Choctaw heritage story, a cup of a slave story, and one spice of a choir story. All within the mix of what we have decided to engage in today. So where did these ingredients come from? Well, the story of Elijah is one of the few stories in the Bible where the person did not physically die, but was taken away. This being a day where many churches celebrate the ascension of Jesus into heaven, it made sense on our quest to understand 
understand the lesser known biblical characters and stories to look at this story. I mean, many of us were first introduced to this story, whether we recognized it or not, as children when we sang, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. Now, as someone who loves Delbert's passion for quality gospel spiritual songs, there is no way that I could go into this story without actually taking time to understand the history of this song. Because it became an interesting element into the classic connections of what God wants us to know and what we're making for today's message. It is one thing to know the basics, the biblical stories, and to understand them for the time when they were written. It is another thing when all of a sudden we add the parallels and the details of other stories in the Bible that can add another layer. And it is even more when we can apply this knowledge to our lives today and even the history that led up to today. Lots of these different layers and ingredients can make something that tastes terrible and goes very, very wrong. So much so that I, Sarah Mann caught me on this. She came up to me and said, you ask a lot of questions, but you don't get a lot of answers. <laughs> and I will be honest, I did not answer any of the questions that I presented a few weeks ago about the best ways to use the biblical text. Because there are many wrong ways to use it. But there are also many right ways to use it. And how we use this amazing book depends on what we think or understand or study or complicatedly try to figure out what God wants us to ultimately make. Does God want a world of fear? Because that's how some people use does God want a world of love? Other people use it that way. Other people understand this book in a way that creates exclusive communities, where others try to create inclusive communities. Others like to use this book in a way that is limited, and others use it as a way to create a sense of unlimited. Must we follow the recipe and the ingredients exactly, or is there a point where God has actually entrusted us to make similar dishes with new ingredients and ideas? I mean, we've already read, as we've gathered all these ingredients, we've read today's scripture, Gail read that for us. We heard the worship and wonder story about the ascension, and if you really look, it's even more complicated. You can see that there are connections between Moses parting the Red Sea and Elijah parting the Jordan River. So just as Moses had to hand his leadership over to Joshua, we find Elijah handing his mantle over to Elisha in a time when those in power, the pharaohs and the kings, have been oppressive. And then we add in this song that we learned as children as the first introduction into the story of Elijah's Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. And I will read to you the basics from the thriving, wonderful resource that will make my seminary professor's skin crawl, but it's from Wikipedia. So here we go. Swing Low, Sweet Chariot was written by Wallace Wills, a child freed men in the old Indian territory. Now, as I was doing more research, this means that more than likely, he was one of the people who was part of the Trail of Tears. And so this happened sometimes after 1865. He sometimes is assumed to be inspired by the sight of the Red River where he was toiling and working. And that river reminded him of the Jordan River and the story of the prophet Elijah being taken to, away to heaven by a chariot. Some even will claim that this song, along with some of his other songs, had lyrics that referred to help people during the Underground Railroad and the Freedom Movement as people moved to the North. 
Alexander Reed, a minister at the nearby school, the Old Spencer Academy, which was a boarding school for the Choctaw, heard him singing these songs and transcribed the words and melodies, and then he sent these songs to the Jubilee Singers at Fisk University, one of the predominantly African-American um, schools early on in Nashville, Tennessee, and the Jubilee Singers popularized the songs to help raise money for the school in the United States and Europe. Wow. A song that we sing with gusto and learn as children that combines with a history of so many stories. And so now if we look at these complicated ingredients, we have another river and body of water, another wandering in the wilderness to unknown lands, and another oppressive power struggle. And the people in this story, while they're not the followers of Moses, the prophets that stood beside Elijah, or the disciples of Jesus upon the ascension, instead this time they are a choir who then had to go out and share this song into the future. And so now at this point as we and you have joined in with me to gather all this information, it comes down to this. What do you make with this information? No, really. We're in a study together. We're journeying together. What do you make? What do you think God wants us to make? As you hear all of these little pieces, what are your thoughts? You are asking. I, I am asking. I know the title is a question mark. <laughs> Here. 
And we, however, though, must allow ourselves to not always be able to make sense of what is happening on our own, but we are called to invite the mystery in. That is where we are headed, to the most intangible and current life-giving aspect of our divine connection. The story of Elijah and the story of the Ascension ultimately connect us with the story that leads us to next week, the story of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit can turn our messy creations often into God's work of art, even when we ourselves fail. But it takes us to have a trust, a true trust in the unknown and a prayer that constantly must be asked for wisdom so that God helps us see what God really wants us to see so that we can question ourselves and be vulnerable in ourselves, but rely on the mysterious spirit that recognizes that we are part of a living story that has parallels and repeats in some ways because it has not been perfected. We do not live in a perfect world, and thus God is not finished. So I challenge you today to ask those big questions throughout this week of how do you understand not only this text, but as we prepare for Pentecost, how do you understand the Holy Spirit working through this text, through history, through our lives, and most importantly, into the fact that we are part of the story of the future. How are you going to play a supporting role to the Spirit?